Well, good morning again. We are in week two of uh, Breakfast Church. So a few hours ago, this room looked very different. It was set up with tables and tablecloths and food and hot drinks. And we had a full room. I'm just reporting to you kind of what happened. Those of you who may be curious, we had a very full room uh, today. Lots of people, uh, even more than, than last week. And so we're very, very grateful for that. If you're looking for a different experience, you want to try Breakfast Church, that's 8.45 till 10 o'clock uh, every Saturday. Saturday morning, right here in the same place. Well, um, I want to share with you about a book that David Zahn released earlier this year, and it's a book called Seculosity. Seculosity is this, this combination of two words, the secular and religiosity. And the premise of the book really is that while our culture has become more secular, and many would say that they are less religious today than they were before, that that's not really the, tr- the truth, that we aren't less religious. We may not go to church as Americans in the same number as we once did, and Americans may not say that they're Christian or of a particular religion like they once did, but we are still just as religious as we've ever been. And that is because we are seeking other things, secular things, to meet the need that religion once met. Now, Zahn, he, he kind of uh, defines religion loosely when he says that religion is whatever we lean on to tell us we're okay and that our lives matter. Whatever we lean on, what do you lean on to tell you you're okay and that your life matters? Well, for many of us, that would be Jesus. That would be a a relationship with him. It would be, you know, pursuing uh, Christ and the gospel. But today, uh, Zahn would say it's any number of other secular things that we would pursue to kind of tell us that we are okay and that our lives matter. And he devotes a chapter to every one of these secular pursuits that people are kind of pursuing religiously. Things like work, busyness, exercise, romance, parenting, the family. These are all things that we lean on, that we pursue to tell us we're okay, that our lives matter. Or as Zahn would say, We lean into these things to prove our enoughness. And this is a word he uses throughout the book, our enoughness. That look at, you know, we'd say, look at my job. Look how successful I am. Look how good I am at it. I am enough. Or look how busy I am. Because I'm so busy, I must be enough. My life must matter. I must be okay. Or exercise. I'm in better shape than you. I'm physically fit. My doctor says I'm doing okay. Therefore, I must be enough. Or look how much I am loved. Or look at this wonderful person that I am together with. Or look at my family, how together they are, how connected they are, how socially integrated my kids are, the great grades that they're getting, how successful they are in sports. All of these things are telling me that my life matters, that everything's okay, that I'm enough. Well, he goes on to write uh, a very convicting sentence when he says, the promise of salvation has fastened onto more everyday pursuits like work, exercise, and romance. You get that? That we pursue these things with the promise of saving us, of telling us that we matter. And what's the result? It's making us anxious, lonely, and unhappy. Why? Because we're pursuing things that can never fully satisfy us the way we were created to be satisfied. You know, whether you are here today as a committed follower of Jesus or you're here just investigating Christianity and maybe you still say that you're kind of a spiritual skeptic, I think all of us can relate to pursuing these secular things, seeking meaning, trying to tell ourselves that we're okay, that we're enough. But if you're a committed Christian, there's one that was on this list that we kind of pursue wholeheartedly, feeling no guilt or shame whatsoever because we believe that pursuing this one thing is tantamount to pursuing God. And that is, of course, family. We believe that our family values and pursuing family and prioritizing family is the same thing as pursuing God or a relationship with Jesus. And therefore, we wholeheartedly uh, value our families and pursue our families and we allow our families to identify who we are. You know, Barna recently did a survey that found that Americans are most likely to point to their family as making up the most significant part of their personal identity. Family is number one. That's what forms my identity. Number two would be the fact that I'm an American. Number three, a distant third would be my religious faith. And this is true even of Christians. 
Again, we would say our family defines us because in our culture, family values and Christian values seem to be synonymous. Jesus is the one who gave us family values, right? Therefore, by pursuing family values, we're pursuing Jesus. And let me just make it very clear. I am all for the family. I love my family. I love many of your families. I believe we should invest in our families. We should have healthy families. I believe the church should talk about family values. That's why we're doing a series in the family right now called The Storm Toss Family. I, I believe that we should talk about the family even more now because traditional family values have been attacked, have been undermined, have been redefined. We need to focus on these things. But here's the thing. If you read the words of Jesus and the things he says about the family, you would have the suspicion he's not one of us. The things Jesus said about the family were so shocking in his culture are so shocking in our culture, many times when you come to these places in the Bible, you just read right over them. You're like, I don't even know what that means. I don't get it. That is so foreign. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at some of those shocking statements that Jesus made about the family. And I have to tell you, as a 21st century communicator, my tendency will be to try and soften these things to kind of balance them, to justify them, to say things like, well, this isn't what he is saying, but this is what he's saying. But here's the thing, Jesus never did any of that. He just made these shocking statements and just kind of let them, you figure that out. You wrestle with that. He wasn't concerned about balancing things out. And so I'm going to do my best to not try and kind of soften these things. So if the only exposure you've ever had to Jesus is Jesus meek and mild, today may be a bit offensive to you. And I, I'm just warning you, it may be a bit offensive. His words may be a bit offensive. So let's start with one of, of Jesus' uh, statements that what was shocking, uh, but it's a very well known, if you've spent any time around a church or read any of the Bible, this will be familiar to you. But it's found in Luke's Gospel, the 14th chapter, and this is what Jesus says. He says, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So Jesus is giving this condition of discipleship, a condition of being his follower. And what is that condition? Carrying their cross and following him. Now, that sounds somewhat shocking to us, but nowhere near as shocking as it would have been to his first century audience. Why? Because we don't understand fully the horror of the cross. We don't understand, we don't see people being crucified on the side of the road. But his original audience, his first century audience, would fully understand the horror of crucifixion, what it meant to take up one's cross. They saw people being crucified by the Romans on a regular basis. They would walk by them on the road. They would put them right there on the road so that people would be terrorized by this. And so when Jesus would say, you know, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, the full impact would hit his original audience, and they understood this as an invitation to come and die with him, to be crucified with Christ, as we talked about last week in the first part of this series. But the truly shocking part of this statement that we often miss is that the statement is given in the context of the family. Let's go back one verse. Look at the one verse before, verse 27. Look at verse 26, and this is what Jesus says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Are you shocked yet? Are you horrified yet? What in the world is Jesus saying? Well, he is talking about the cross and our family values in the same idea. And what he is inviting us to do is to allow him to crucify our family values and to view our family through the lens of the cross. And that's what we're talking about in the series. But let's just back up and, and talk about what does, what does he mean? Hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters? Our initial reaction is we just want to soften this. We just want to soften it. Clearly he doesn't mean what it sounds like he means. At our discussions this morning at breakfast table, it was just everyone wanted to go right there. Well, he doesn't mean hate. He means love less, right? And, and I've heard that and I get it. I understand. But Jesus is trying to get our attention. He is trying, he's using very strong words intentionally. 
as though he is trying to, to shock us. And I remember the first time I read this passage, I was in my mid-20s, it was the first time, I was a brand new Christian, just reading through the Bible for the first time. I came to this passage and it, I, I just stopped in my track, what in the world is Jesus saying? I, my, my first son had just been born, Luke, he was about a year old, and he was so adorable and so easy to love when he was one year old. I mean, he was just like, oh, you know, and I just remember thinking, is Jesus telling me to hate my son, whom I love, who I would take a bullet for? Is that what God is saying? And I remember I went to my pastor, who I had great respect for, and I remember opening up to Luke 14, saying, what is Jesus saying, pastor? And I remember him kind of shaking his head and laughing like, yeah, what is he saying? And we've been trying to figure this out for 2,000 years. But then he began to explain to me this, this relational hierarchy that the Gospels give us, that Jesus gives us, where Jesus and, and, and God the Father are number one. And they're so far up there as number one that by comparison, we would be willing to forsake our family if we had to that we would be willing to walk away from them and forsake them for Jesus if we had to. It was this relational hierarchy. God first, biological family second, distant second. That's pretty shocking. It's pretty hard to kind of grasp. Like, wow, I thought Jesus would want me to put my family first. No, God first, family second. But Jesus didn't just teach this, but he modeled this in his own family. If you look at how Jesus interacted with his own family, this is what he did. And we see it from the very beginning. You know, we get one kind of window glimpse into the Mary and Joseph household while Jesus was a youngster. And and it's in Matthew chapter 2, I believe, no, excuse me, Luke chapter 2, where uh, Jesus is 12, and Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus, they all go to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Right? They go down from Nazareth, which would have been about a 90-mile walk, and they're there for the Passover week, and then they get ready to go back, and Mary and Joseph and all their friends are in the caravan back to Nazareth. They think Jesus is with them. He's not. It takes them three days until they realize Jesus isn't with us. They backtrack, and they finally find him in the temple talking with the teachers of the law, theology. Three days later, and mom finds Jesus, and an exasperated Mary says, basically, in so many words, what are you doing here? Didn't you know we were like worried sick about you? Like we've been looking for you for three days. What are you doing? Now, the picture of Jesus we would have in our mind, Jesus would say, I am so sorry, mom. Wow, time got away from me. I'm so sorry you've been worried for three days. I've been so disrespectful. Please forgive me. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says to her, he's he's like, why have you done this to your father and me? And, and Jesus says, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Listen to what he's saying. Mary's saying, your father and I were looking for you. And Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? In other words, you know, Mary's talking about her, his father, Joseph. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. There's somebody above Joseph. It's my heavenly father. From the age of 12, Jesus understood this relational hierarchy that his father in heaven, was his number one priority. That was his father. And then below that came Mary and Joseph. Or go forward to Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is adult now. He's he's in his ministry. He's teaching in a home. He's been teaching all day. And his family comes to him in Matthew chapter 12. And says, while, it says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Now, if you look at Mark's uh, gospel of the same story, Mark tells us why the family was there. They heard that Jesus' ministry was kind of getting out of hand. They didn't really understand what was happening. And they kind of thought he was kind of losing his mind a little bit, delusions of grandeur. So they went to kind of take Jesus back to Nazareth so they could have some time with him to talk some sense into him. So it says in the next verse, someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who are my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Again, listen to what Jesus is saying. First of all, he's being somewhat dismissive of his biological family. But second, he is redefining what family is really all about. 
And this is where things get really sticky for us. Because it's comfortable for us, if you're a follower of Jesus, to be able to say, yeah, yeah, God first, family second, for sure. I am on board with that. Because it's so easy to deceive ourselves into really believing that we're prioritizing God over our families. I could say, I'm going to put God first and fool myself the whole time. Not that we necessarily do, but we often do. But here Jesus is redefining the family and saying, actually, there's a step above your biological family. And it's a family that you enter into and you begin to follow me. It has nothing to do with your blood connection or your biology. It all has to do with your position toward me. That when you begin to follow me, you become a son, a daughter of the Father in heaven, which means Jesus becomes your big brother, which means everyone else who is following him becomes your brother and sister. It is those who do the will of my Father in heaven, Jesus says. That is my first primary family. So he's giving us this new hierarchy. You've got God and his family. That's our top priority. Then we have our biological family, and then we have everybody else. Shocking? I mean, if we were to take a poll today, before we came in and started hearing these shocking statements of Jesus and said, okay, what is your relational hierarchy? We would probably say something like this. Well, we've got my family, who is number one, and then we've got God, number two, and then church, and then others. Now, some of us who are more savvy and spiritual, we would put God above family. But if we looked at how we made our decisions, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, the question would be, really, what is the highest value? Maybe we'd put God first, we don't know. But then Jesus comes and he says, no, 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 no. Different hierarchy, different priority list. He kind of flips it around. He says, no, God is first in his family, then my family, and then others. This is what it looks like to take up your cross and to follow me. And this is exactly what it looked like for his first followers. This is what he asked them to do. Think about his first 12, his, his first 12 followers, the disciples. Think about guys like um, Peter and Andrew and James and John and what they had to do to follow Jesus. These are guys who were fishermen by trade, which meant they learned the trade from their father and their grandfather that there was a family fishing business that went back generations, that they knew all their lives that they were going to be fishermen. And as they grew up and they were adults, they were in the business, they were cleaning the nets, they were fishing, they were selling the fish, they were helping to support the larger family. This was their inheritance. This was their identity. And they knew that their children after them, this is how they would make a living because they would keep the business going until their sons would be old enough to then take it over and keep the business going. But Jesus, this rabbi, comes along and says, Drop your nets and follow me. That doesn't seem very shocking in our culture because we change careers, we change jobs all the time. But in the first century Jewish culture, this would have been radical. Jesus is asking these guys basically to repudiate their families, to abandon the family business, to leave their fathers and grandfathers to fend for themselves as they go off with Jesus and teach people and become fishers of men. Jesus' calling of his disciples itself was radically anti-family. Is this offensive? If it is, don't shoot the messenger, okay? I'm just telling you what Jesus said and what Jesus did, okay? But if you're not offended yet, let me just share one more radical statement of Jesus, and if nothing else got you, this will certainly offend you. Another time, another disciple came to him and said this. Another disciple said to him, this is a Jesus follower. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, first what? I mean, what was Jesus asking him to do? So, certainly Jesus is calling him into relationship with himself. He's calling him into service with him, to follow him. And this man says, okay, yeah, I want to do that. But first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. I want you to imagine that you're an employer, maybe you are, maybe you hire people. Imagine that you, you're, you, you find this great candidate and they're going to like move from like St. Louis or something, they're going to relocate to Denver, they're going to start working for you on your team or your company, and they say to you, you know, my, my father is undergoing chemotherapy, actually he's in, he's in hospice care, he only has a few months to go. Is it okay if I wait to relocate to Denver until, so I could have these last few months with my father and then come? I mean, can you imagine saying to someone, no, come now, or you don't get the job. I mean, that's what Jesus is doing. 
This man in this culture has the total obligation to care for his dying father, to care for his father in his old age, to take care of him. He is playing the trump card with Jesus. I mean, this is the end of the argument. Jesus says, come and follow me. And I can just imagine that this guy is saying this line as he's walking away, knowing Jesus is going to be like, oh, if you've got to take care of your father, go. He's like, hey, let me first go take care of my father, and then I'll come back and follow you. And Jesus stops him in his tracks when he said, no, follow me. I come first. Wow. He asks us the same thing today. He says, put me first. Even before your family, I want you to put me first. But again, in our, in our culture and with our values, we think family and following Jesus, they're kind of simul- they're, they're like synonymous. They're, they're, they're together. That we're, as I honor my family, I'm actually honoring God in many ways. That's true. But how often have we, you and me, used the excuse of our family to follow Jesus in a way that is certainly far from radical are all in. How many times have we sensed Jesus calling us to do something, to give something, to invest something? And our trump card is, I need to invest in my family right now. Sorry, Jesus. I need to invest in my family right now. I think Jesus would say the same thing to us today. Follow me. I'm first. I remember early in my ministry reading uh, an article in a ministry magazine. It was an interview with this, this, this group of, of well-known um, pastors, and they were all from different generations. There was young pastors and middle-aged pastors and older retired pastors. And I remember this one pastor who I respected. He was retired now. And he was talking about the mistakes that he and his generation had made in ministry. And, and he said, yeah, unfortunately, we made some, some mistakes. And he said, we sacrificed our families on the altar of ministry. And if you're maybe an older pastor, you're a retired pastor, maybe you grew up in a pastor's home as a PK, you know exactly what this guy is saying. That there was a generation of pastors who just kind of gave it all to the church and gave it all to ministry and gave it all to Jesus at the neglect of their family. And now we have all these people who are disassociated. Many have walked away from Jesus, walked away from the church because of the resentment that they have over what their their parents did. We sacrificed our families on the altar of ministry. But then he said something that has haunted me (laughs) to this day. He said, yeah, we older pastors, we sacrificed our families on the altar of ministry, but you younger pastors, you sacrificed ministry on the altar of family. It's two ditches. And we can go so in for Jesus that we completely neglect our family. And here's where I'm trying to balance it out, and Jesus, again, didn't do this. I'm just doing this, but... Or we can go so far into our family that we completely neglect the call of Jesus. There's clearly this tension that that we're called to live in where we prioritize Jesus over and above everything else while at the same time loving our church and also investing in our family. So here's the question. Why would a God of love, why would Jesus, who wants us to live these abundant lives, why would he talk like this? about the family? Why would he make these radical, shocking statements about the people that are closest to us in our lives? Well, again, Jesus never qualified it. He never explained it. And so I am left to try and figure it out. And I'm going to offer some things to you that I think are in line with some of the other things Jesus said. But why? Why would Jesus talk like this? Well, first of all, I think it's because our families may have very different spiritual values and beliefs from many of us. And many times we have to disassociate in some ways with our family if we're going to follow Jesus. This is certainly true of his original audience. In the first century, the people Jesus was talking to, many of them would have to leave their family, say goodbye to their family in order to follow him because of differences in religion. And it's been true in every culture since the last 2,000 years. It's still true today in many parts of the world. If someone wants to follow Jesus out of a Buddhist or a Hindu or a a Muslim or a Jewish background, many times they have to leave their family. Many times their families will banish them, will beat them, at times even kill them because they are saying they want to follow Jesus. And 
And, and, and to that, Jesus would say, that is a tragedy, and that is unjust, and that is sad, but I'm worth it. Because no one loves you the way I love you. No one has died to forgive you. No one has reconciled you to the Father the way I have. And no one is going to give you an eternity where you have no regrets like I can. So we need to know that our families may have very different spiritual values and beliefs from us. And so we may need to sometimes kind of walk away and be able to kind of separate. But many of us would say, well, I, I don't have to do that. I, I don't have that problem. My family, they, they all love Jesus, so why should I have to, to decide between following Jesus or following my family? And in many ways, that's the most beautiful thing. When we can have a family, a biological family, that are all in the faith and all tracking Jesus in the same direction, that's an awesome thing. But we still need the church. Our temptation is, well, now I'm just going to focus on my biological family to the neglect of the church. But there's reasons why we can't do that. And, and I, Actually, I, I wanted to share this with you, this verse, um, back to the, the point about uh, the, the families having different values. Jesus did say that there's a reward for those who leave their family for his sake because he anticipated it. And he said this in Luke chapter 18, he said, uh, Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. And we learn so much from that one statement. First thing is that Jesus understands that there will be times when our family have very different beliefs and values than we do. And he understands that there will be times that we need to step away and, and disassociate from families in order to follow him. But he also says there's a reward in that, not just in the age to come, and that's the one we often focus on. Well, certainly we have eternity, but Jesus promised in this age we would have many times as much. And we may wonder, well, how in the world can I get many times as much? What does that look like? Well, I experienced this in a small degree when I came to faith in my mid-20s. When I was in my mid-20s, before I became a Christian, I had this large social network, lots of friends, but they were happy hour friends. Many of you know what I'm talking about. They are friends that I would go to happy hour with, and all we would do is drink, and we would party, and that was our only commonality. That was our number one commonality, was we like to have fun. And when I became a Christian, and Jesus turned my life upside down, I realized I didn't want to live that way. I didn't want to do those things anymore. And so I still tried to hang out with these friends, but we had nothing in common anymore. And pretty soon, we just stopped hanging out together. And I lost that entire social network. But at the same time, I gained a whole new social network as I became a part of God's family, the church. And now I had all this new social network of people who I had much more commonality with that went much deeper. It wasn't as superficial. And a place where I experienced love like I had never experienced love before from people who weren't my biological family. And it changed my life. And to this day, the church has given me more than anything I've ever had to let go of for the sake of following Jesus, right? So again, some of us don't have to make that choice. Some of us, we, uh, we, growing up or our whole family comes to faith at the same time, we don't have to make that choice. But here's what we need to realize. We still need to prioritize the church because it is in the context of God's family that I learned how to be a healthy family. It is in this context, or the context of our groups, the context of the Christian community like Daniel and, and Jamie are such a part of, that we learn how to be godly husbands, godly mothers, godly fathers, godly siblings, and parents, and, 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 and children. If we stay locked in our family of origin or our biological families, we, we just continue to replay the old tapes, we continue to play replay the inheritance that we talked about from our parents last year, or last week, and we get stuck in a rut. But when I open myself to God's family, I begin to learn and heal and grow in ways that I couldn't otherwise. So in my case, when my boys were young, um, I never had 
the model of a godly father in my life. I never had really the model even of a father in my life. I did not know how to be a godly father to Luke and Logan. But because I was surrounded by Christian community and by fathers who had children the similar age, I was able to talk with them and watch them and learn from them. And they mentored me and they made me a much better father than I ever could have been had I just focused on trying to figure it out on my own and kind of replaying everything I learned as a child, which is what we often try to do. But more than that, I mean, how could the church be God's family if we just focused on our biological families? I mean, what is going to become of the couple who is separated by distance or family dynamics from all of their surrounding family? What happens to them? Where do they get support? Where do they get encouragement? Where do they get family if everyone in the church is just focused on their biological family? What of the person who has to leave their family because of different values or beliefs and now feels isolated? Where do they get support? Where do they get encouragement if not through the Christian family? Or what about the single who's looking for community? The single young man, the single young woman, whether heterosexual or homosexual, and they're trying to live celibate lifestyles and they're trying to press in and get encouragement and emotional support and they're trying to find family. Where does that person turn if all we're doing is focusing on our biological family and kind of giving the church, God's family, whatever's left over. And, and the point is, is that the church is not what the church is intended to be, this radical world-changing movement, unless we prioritize it the way Jesus told us to prioritize it. One final thing I would say about why Jesus would talk like this, and it's just this, that, that only Jesus has what we need to know our lives matter and that we're enough. So Jesus created me, he created you, created all of us. He knows what we need to feel like our lives matter and that we're enough and that we're okay. And he knows that if you or I focus on our family to prove to us that we are enough or that we're okay or to tell us, you know, that we matter, that we're going to end up frustrated and disappointed. And there's two ways to do this in a destructive way, two ditches to fall into when we prioritize our family. And one is when we throw all of the blame of all of our problems on our family. And many of us do that, right? It's like, oh man, my parents screwed me up. The things they did to me, the things they didn't do to me, do for me. My, my kids, if my kids would just listen, if my kids would just get on board, my kids would do better at school. If my spouse hadn't betrayed me and, and broken me the way he or she did, I wouldn't be the person that I am. And we take all of our problems and all of our pain and we lay it at the feet of our family. And that is one way that we prioritize our family over and above Jesus. And the other way, of course, is to completely idealize our family and to say, you know, our family is, is going to be... the the, the place where I find my significance and my, my spouse is going to make me feel valuable and give me a sense of transcendence, that my children are going to be my second chance to live and I'm going to live vicariously through them and they're going to succeed and they're going to have every opportunity that I have never had. That my family, whenever we get together, we're going to be connected and transparent. We're going to have honest, authentic communication and we're all going to get along and we're all going to value each other and hear each other. We idealize our families to the point where we put so much pressure on them to deliver what they can never deliver. And we end up again frustrated and disappointed with our families. And in in the midst of all this, Jesus invites us to take up our cross and follow him and to crucify these family values and to come and die with him. And as we walk with him to Golgotha and as we lay ourselves down on the cross and we feel the nails piercing our hands and feet along with him through faith, that he begins to crucify all these expectations that we've placed on things that can never meet them. And he begins to heal us and he begins to grow us and he begins to set us free. Because once we've died, we're free to really live. And then we're able to go back to our families after dying with Jesus and we're able to love them just as they are as the gift God intended them to be. This is a principle Jesus teaches again and again all throughout the Gospels, is that unless something dies, it can't really live. That unless I'm willing to lose my life, I can't really find it. Unless I'm willing to die, I'm not able to truly live. Unless I am able to crucify my family values and the expectations I put in my family, I can't truly love them in freedom. 
So I'd love to know where you are with this um, or where this is landing with you. Uh, again, we, we talked a little bit about our Connect cards, and if you have those and you want to take them out, um, go ahead and grab a pen. Maybe as we've kind of gone through this, you realize that there's some prayer that you would like for your, your family. We had such a good time this last week praying for those of you who gave prayer requests. Multiple times this week, our pastoral staff prayed over your requests. It just made me feel connected with so many of you as you shared transparently things that were happening in your homes, in your life, in your workplace. If you like prayer, go ahead and write that down. Something for your family. Or on the front side, uh, under next steps, maybe today you realize that you have been pursuing things secular things to to prove that you matter, to prove that you're enough, to prove that you're okay, and you realize those things are not going to satisfy, and you would like to come and die with Jesus and take up your cross and follow him. And if that's the case, you could just take that next step, say that you said yes to Jesus today, or you recommitted your life to Jesus today. We would love to celebrate that with you. Or if you want to just write a comment in the comment box, maybe you want to say, I'm offended, or this is horrible, I don't get it. Or if you really want to make it simple, I'll give you three options. Uh, you could write a number, one, two, or three, in the comment box. And you write the number one if you're like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And I understand if you don't get it. Because for 2,000 years, we've been trying to get this, and it just doesn't make any sense. doesn't seem to line up with who Jesus was, but these are the things that he said. And if you're just like, you know what, I don't get it, go ahead and put number one. Or if you'd like to say, I get it, but I'm struggling with this. Easier said than done, right? To crucify our family values and to prioritize God and his family over and above our biological family. We don't even know what that looks like. But to put two, you would say, I am willing to have the Holy Spirit kind of lead me to a place where I would be open to this and and, and willing to kind of go there. Or if you want to put number three, I get it and I'm in. I am ready to crucify my family values and put God in his family first, my biological family second, and it may be really awkward to write a number three sitting by your kids or your spouse. (laughs) Yeah, some things are better left unsaid, and I learned that. Um, It was early, uh, again, in my Christian walk when I was going through all this, and I read Luke 14, I went to my pastor, and he told me about this priority list, and I got it. I understood it. I was so passionate about following Jesus, and, and so I went home, to have a conversation with my wife. Now again, some things are better left unsaid. I am not advising you do this at home. But I said, Kim, I love you. You are the most important human being in my life. But I just want you to know, God's first. You're second. Yeah, Kim didn't land really good with a young wife who was still trying to figure out whether she wanted to follow Jesus or not. But since then, Kim has not only adopted that same relational hierarchy, but I think she would tell you that having that priority list has given her a better husband than she ever would have had otherwise. Because every morning I am going to Jesus and I am dying with him and he is sending me back to her to say I'm sorry. Or sending me back to her to tell her how much I love her. Sending me back to her when I realize that she's going through something difficult. It's Jesus doing that living in me. And he'll do that for every one of us if we are willing to crucify our family values so that we can love our families the way Jesus wants us to. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the families that you've given us. We want to thank you, Jesus, that putting you first even above them is so incredibly rewarding because you have what we need to be able to turn back and love our families. So would you teach us what it looks like and lead us to crucify our family values so that we could love them like only you can. And we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.